everybody. Uh, it's very, uh, very good to see you. Uh, it, uh, uh, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> it was an eventful campaign. Um, let me start by uh, reflecting on uh, the election result. I think this uh, was a message that was sent certainly to me, to our government from British Columbians, that they expect us to do better on a number of key files. But equally, it was the opportunity for us to do better. And I am very grateful uh, and honored uh, by uh, the opportunity presented by British Columbians to be able to do just that with the team that we're bringing to the legislature. Uh, the electeds uh, that we're bringing to Victoria following yesterday's results are one of the most diverse and qualified groups of MLAs that this legislature has ever seen. I'm incredibly proud of them. Uh, they uh, represent uh, the first time ever in this province that the NDP has been elected three times to serve, and we take that uh, honor very seriously. And our goal here is to make sure that this place behind me works for British Columbians, especially on the priorities uh, that were so evident during the campaign. The cost of living, the pressure that people are feeling on their monthly bills at the end of every month, feeling like they're just getting by or not even getting by, let alone getting ahead. The need for affordable housing, strong and safe communities, addressing big challenges like climate change, making sure this province is a welcoming place for everybody, and ensuring a strong healthcare system from corner to corner to corner of this beautiful province that we call home. Uh, that's what our work will be going forward. Uh, I'm honored to be asked to take it on. I met with the Lieutenant Governor, advised her that I believed uh, that we could uh, um, deliver the confidence of the legislature, and she invited us to farm government. Uh, that work is underway. And I'm happy to take your questions and look forward to doing the work for British Columbians on the priorities they've sent us to work on. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We have members of the media here in person as well as those on the phone line. For those on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. All members of the media will be limited to one question and one follow-up. We're gonna begin today with Richard Zussman from Global News. Go ahead, Richard. When should we expect to be back here in a session? Uh, what is the priority for that? And are you going to be having negotiations with the Greens, even though you have now a majority government? Uh, well, there, there are two uh, important pieces of work to do here. Uh, the first is we've got to uh, choose a cabinet uh, and make sure that, uh, that that piece of work uh, is done so that we can begin delivering for British Columbians. And the second is to make sure that the legislature uh, works as well. And so having a sitting uh, in the fall, the election and selection of a speaker, uh, I would very much like to be able to do that and, uh, and to get the legislature working as well. These are two important pieces of work. And uh, beyond that, um, the conversations that are taking place uh, with MLAs in the legislature uh, are, uh, are underway. Our goal is to work with any MLA that wants to make sure that this place works for British Columbians on those prior priorities that I laid out, cost of living, housing, healthcare, uh, what matters to British Columbians. And so uh, to that end, meeting with the Greens today, uh, we're gonna continue to have those conversations with them. And, uh, and the invitation is open to all MLAs. Uh, if you're committed to these things, as well as committed to ensuring that this province remains a place welcoming to everybody, one where we fight racism and hatred, uh, then uh, I'm happy to work with you. And Richard, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, California announced today some additional support for the film industry. Uh, it was something you promised during the campaign. Should we expect more here in British Columbia to try to keep up with the incentives California is putting in place in order to ensure that the sector can thrive here? Um, the message to film workers in British Columbia, who I know are feeling a lot of uh, the pressures of the big streamers dialing back their budgets and, uh, and other pressures facing the industry, is that we're in your corner. We're going to work with you to make sure that our industry is competitive, and we know that if we're competitive, uh, we can bring in the big productions. And, uh, and we're not going to be able to, uh, to outbid the lowest uh, common denominator bidders in the United States. But uh, if we're competitive, combined with the amazing crews that we have here and the teams that we have, uh, we can deliver some of the biggest uh, productions available uh, given what we offer here in the province, and that's my commitment to them. We're going to work with you to make sure we're competitive and landing those big productions. Our next question will come from Rob Buffum from CTV News. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, Premier. Congratulations. Um, one, just hoping you can provide maybe a little bit more detail in terms of when a cabinet would be sworn in and when you expect a fall session. Would it be in November, the fall session? Is it more likely in December? Just some ballpark ideas.
previous there. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, we're a little bit in the hands of elections VC here. Uh, the judicial recounts uh, need to be complete, uh, in my opinion, before we select the cabinet and, and have them sworn in. So we'll work with elections VC on those timelines, but our goal will be as soon as possible after those results are finalized uh, to have the cabinet in place and get to work for British Columbians. Then let me show you why I stopped paying for all my other sample libraries. This is Arcade by Output. This thing has sound samples. Well, is the cabinet in, in the fall session? Would oh, yeah. that be just him? So the, the goal is to get the cabinet sworn in, and then we're going to be able to have the fall sitting. In December, November, you don't know? It's, it's hard. It, it's very dependent on elections, BC, the timing uh, going forward here. Um, you made the point earlier in a press conference, and I think your team have said that you've been, you and your team have been reaching out to conservatives as well. And the idea of you know maybe a conservative speaker of the house wanted to get your thoughts on whether that might be possible i'm thinking of a candidate in chilliwack cultus lake warbus um there i mean have, have can you tell us might we be looking at a conservative speaker of the house is that a possibility well i i have had the opportunity to work with a number of people who were elected under the conservative banner they worked as bc liberals and then as bc united um, I haven't had the opportunity to work with all of the people who were elected uh, as conservatives in the recent election, but my commitment to every MLA that was elected is if you share our values around making sure this is a welcoming province for everyone, that we're going to fight hate and racism, these are uh, non-negotiables for us, then we're happy to work with you to make sure that the legislature behind me works for British Columbians on those priorities that we all share. And so it's an open invitation to, uh, to any MLA uh, to work with us. There are a number of ways uh, that, uh, that MLAs could work with us to deliver for British Columbians. One of those ways is certainly speaker. I know we've got some great candidates on our bench. I'm sure the Greens uh, would be able to put forward a good speaker, maybe the Conservatives. Uh, we're not ruling anything out. Our next question will come from Les Lane from the Times Columnist. Go ahead, Les. Thanks. Thanks. Premier election night, one of the first thoughts you had uh, 11 o'clock or so was that you would um, absolutely acknowledge John Ruck, Rusted speaking to people's frustrations with affordability, cost of living, and public safety and crime. It, it, I was just wondering, since that was your kind of initial outlay, is, is that how you um, this thing almost got away from you? Um, I think that there, there are two parts to, to British Columbians' message to us. One is they absolutely want us to do better on those pieces. I think the Conservatives did a good job of speaking to people about issues that they're concerned about in their communities, public safety, that they're concerned about at home, affordability. Um, obviously, there were significant gaps between us and the Conservatives. I think the Greens did a good job speaking to British Columbians on issues of bureaucracy in the healthcare system and needing to get that uh, closer to the communities that they serve through initiatives like their community health centers. And so uh, for us, when you have a close election like this, where the vote was often uh, split between us and the Greens and the Conservatives very tightly in different communities across the province, I think the message for us is to hear that and to both be appreciative of the opportunity British Columbians are presenting us to, to deliver on that message that they sent to us, but also recognize that uh, we're going to need to work uh, across the aisle on different initiatives to make sure we're responding to the message that we heard. Do you have a follow-up question? And you're building a cabinet. But, um, I'm just wondering about the interior of BC, everywhere north of Hope. Um, those pretty slim pickings compared to the previous legislature. I, I, I don't have the count in front of me. You got maybe half a dozen, fewer than before. Is that a consideration? How are you going to represent or show some represent, representation in cabinet from the mainland BC? Yeah, we've, we've elected some great uh, MLAs from outside the lower mainland, but you're right, I, I do see an urban-rural divide in the election results that's very concerning to me. We need to govern for the entire province, we need to represent the entire province, and that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to make sure uh, that we're finding ways to reach out to and engage rural communities uh, and make sure that they're seeing themselves in, in the legislature as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a province where we only succeed uh, together. If one part of the province is not successful, uh, then the whole province is going to struggle. We need to work together as British Columbians. That was a big message uh, during the campaign, and uh, and one that we saw in the results as well that we're going to have to we're going to have to do better on. The real estate market is rapidly shifting, so if you're thinking about selling a house anywhere within about an hour of Mississauga, including the blue areas on this map, and you want to ensure that you're getting as much for your house as you could and should when you sell then this message is specifically for you because we'd love to share with you a brand new, better way to sell that's working. Our next question will come from Alec Lazenby from the Vancouver Sun. Go ahead, Alec. 
Hi, Premier. You said this morning a uh, fall session. You've now said a fall sitting. Can you clarify whether it will be a fall session or a fall sitting, the difference between that, and also if you've been given any clarification from Elections BC? I know there's the November 4th deadline, but when those recounts might be done. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Alec. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, um, this morning I said fall session. In my mind, a session includes legislation and these other pieces. I meant to say fall sitting. Uh, and so the intent is to get the legislature working, to get a speaker elected uh, so that we can get going uh, with the new uh, elected representatives the British Columbians have sent to Victoria. Uh, we will not be introducing, and it's not my intention to introduce legislation in the fall, but it is my intent, if we can, to have a sitting, get the speaker elected, and get the legislature working for people, as well to get a cabinet selected and sworn in uh, so that we can start working uh, and delivering for British Columbians right away, because I know that's what they want us to do. And now I have a follow-up question. Yes, it's been nine, ten days since the election. What's been the process that you've been going through over that time as you waited for all the results to be in? I know you've been talking to the Greens, the Conservatives, but uh, in terms of what you've been doing over the past nine, ten days, can you give us some clarity on that? Yeah, absolutely. It involved a lot of time with the refresh button on my browser. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an anxious time and a time for uh, reflection. Uh, the good news is that I have uh, an amazing uh, family that um, I got to spend some time with. So that was one thing that Elections BC delivered for us, was a little bit more time with the EB family. Uh, we spent some time together and, uh, and unplugged a bit, which was, uh, which was great. And, uh, and it was offset a little bit by the stress of the results. But, uh, but I'm very uh, appreciative to the residents of Surrey Guilford for sending Gary Begg back. Uh, he's going to be a key part of our team. And, uh, and look forward to the conclusion of this by Elections BC uh, so we can get to work for people. Our next question will come from Emily Fagan from CBC News. Go ahead, Emily. So now that you've heard the voters' feedback uh, with this new government, what do you intend to do differently on public safety and affordability? Well, thanks, Emily. Um, there's, uh, I think that for me, um, the, uh, the, the messages around public safety, affordability, health care, uh, is going to involve uh, some level of cooperation and work uh, across the aisle if we can do it. Um, there was a message from British Columbians that no one party had a monopoly on the best way forward. And, uh, and I think it's going to be an important focus of us. Uh, certainly, um, I know uh, that addressing issues of public drug use, of uh, people struggling with mental health issues, uh, and severe addiction in our streets are a priority for British Columbians. I heard that loud and clear. Uh, so finding ways to accelerate that and making sure we're hearing the message from the Green Party that we don't do it at the expense of people's human rights and dignity, uh, that's a, a core value that I share as well. So uh, we'll find a path forward on these key issues. It won't be uh, easy, but the results, I think, will be better for British Columbians on, on what they really care about. And Emily, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you. Uh, do you intend to move forward with expansions to involuntary care and removing the carbon tax if Ottawa eliminates the requirement for one, as you said during the campaign? Yes, the, uh, the commitment we made to British Columbians was we weren't going to force them to choose between a government uh, that took climate change seriously and would take action on climate change and them being able to cover their grocery costs and cover their rent. Uh, we know that people are struggling with affordability. So yes, we'll, we will keep our commitment to British Columbians. If the federal government uh, uh, moves away from the backstop, we will get rid of the carbon tax and we remain committed to addressing uh, the struggles that people are having in our streets with mental health and addiction. Our next question will come from Dirk Meisner from the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Dirk. Hi. Um, when John Rustad of the BC Conservatives says he wants to throw you guys out of office at first opportunity, how are you going to counteract that? Well, I think that um, British Columbians sent us to this place to make the legislature work for them. I think that uh, the expectation that every voter had was that we would come here and we would do our best to deliver on those priorities that they have, whether it's affordability, affordable housing, health care, uh, uh, the economy, and good paying jobs. Any of these issues, the last thing I think British Columbians want is for us to turn this place into a chance to go back to another election. This isn't a place for electioneering, this is a place for delivering for British Columbians. So I disagree fundamentally with John Rustad on that, as well as on several other critically important issues. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't find ways to, uh, to potentially uh, uh, work together on, uh, on the priorities of British Columbians. I'm, I'm open to that, uh, as long as we all respect that bright line of making sure this province rejects hate and division and conspiracy and focuses on uh, delivering for people. And Dirk, do you have a follow-up question? Sure. When you say work together, can we see some kind of um, big move by you bringing a Green into the Cabinet or possibly a Conservative Speaker? 
Uh, well, my message to all MLAs uh, is the same. Uh, we're, if you're keen to make this place work for British Columbians on the priorities that, they're, that they have, then we're keen to work with you. Uh, and we want this place to be stable. We want this place to work for British Columbians. And, uh, and we're open to all kinds of discussions with MLAs about how that could work and what that would look like. Next question from Mary Brook, Island Social Trends. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, Premier. Um, can you give us an idea of your year one strategy? Are you going to kind of proceed with NDP legislation or that you come up with, or are you going to try and attack things that were presented by the Conservatives during the campaign um, and um, in the sense of trying to reverse or collaborate in a different way? Uh, well, our commitments to British Columbians are clear. We're going to deliver on those election commitments that we made to them. Um, and I think that there, uh, the election result uh, presents a significant message and opportunity for us to work with other MLAs uh, in how we address those uh, commitments we made to British Columbians. So I'd, I'm open to those kinds of conversations with other parties about their priorities. An example is, uh, you know, the Green Party has talked about, um, about moving uh, community services closer to the front line, whether it's housing or health care or water management or other things like that. Um, that's something I think we could work together. How government delivers services, make it more responsive to local communities is, is something I think that is a shared value we have and one uh, we could potentially work closely on. And Mary, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah. One of the first issues last year that the Conservatives were able to get traction on was SOGI in the schools. And I'm just wondering if your government will want to re-examine how SOGI is delivered or just carry on the way it is. Yeah, I think, so for us, it's, it's a non-starter that uh, every kid needs to be safe in school, um, and uh, that's just a core value that we have. Um, and I, I do think, though, uh, what I saw out of the election uh, was a number of people using an anti-bullying program to try to get political advantage, uh, using misinformation. Uh, I saw it uh, quite rampant in, uh, in certain parts of the province, and so I do think there's a responsibility on us to communicate and to, to work with parents uh, to address that misinformation and to make sure kids are supported in schools, and, uh, and we're going to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it was pretty clear to me that we need to do that uh, coming out of the election. Time for one more question. We'll go to Shannon Waters from Narwhal. Go ahead, Shannon. Hi, Premier. During the leaders' debate, you said that if your government was re-elected, you would not be bringing back the proposed changes to the Land Act that caused controversy earlier this year. If those are off the table, what do the next steps of implementing DRIPA look like to your government? Well, the, the message uh, we had for our First Nations partners in governance is that they remain critically important partners and uh, we're gonna work with them on their priorities and on the priorities of British Columbians. Uh, one of the things that we saw and see really clearly in this province is where we address long-standing issues in indigenous communities, the whole region benefits from it. And that's one of the things that I think we're gonna have the opportunity to do a better job of showing over the next four years is, uh, is when we uh, deliver agreements, when we partner with indigenous communities, uh, that the whole region benefits through additional employment, economic activity, uh, and diversity and interest in culture. There's a, whole re there's a whole array of reasons to do this work together. And so uh, the Land Act um, change, because it wasn't connected to any agreement, because it was uh, uh, disconnected from uh, any specific initiative, um, it, uh, it was open to the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of creating concern, which it did. It created huge anxiety in the business community and rural communities. What does it mean? What's it gonna look like for us? And so there's a lesson in that for us, and, uh, and it caused backlash in a number of Indigenous communities. And so uh, for me, I'm taking that lesson really seriously. Uh, better communication with communities, uh, much uh, clearer understanding in regions about what we're doing, uh, who we're partnering with, and how everybody's going to be included in those discussions. Uh, and, uh, and I know our Indigenous partners are on side for that as well. Uh, it's going to be, it's hard work, uh, but we're going to do it, and we're going to push forward because it's so important for the future of our province. And Shannon, do you have a follow-up question? I do. Um, Nathan Cullen was the minister who was <coughs> handling that uh, portfolio, and he was not re-elected. Um, you're also, Murray Rankin has transitioned out of government, didn't seek re-election. Um, do you have any concerns about sort of the level of expertise and understanding at the cabinet level for working on this issue going forward? Uh, we've, we've got a remarkable uh, 
cohort of MLAs who were elected. It is the, um, I think, one of the, if not the most diverse and qualified groups of MLAs this province has ever seen. It includes strong Indigenous leaders, uh, and, uh, and I have no uh, question that I've got uh, the folks in place uh, to make a cabinet and put a cabinet together that will be able to address not just reconciliation issues, but all of the challenges that our province faces that British Columbia sent us to address. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you.